We've been focusing here on chapter 11 and chapter 12 in the book of Hebrews and up until this point, two weeks ago in chapter 11, Paul laid out the, the heroes of faith, those that have gone before us that we heard about their struggles and their trials and how they persevered in those struggles and, and trials because of their, their faith. And we saw how they were stretched, how they were stretched for greatness. And last week, Paul then told us, since we're surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, he told us what we're to do with that. And as we heard last week, the orders, our marching orders that he gave us was to rid ourselves of every sin and burden that clings to us so as to persevere in running the race. So just like a runner who wants to rid themselves of everything that's keeping them from running freely in the race of reaching their goal, it's what we're to do. As anything, as we talked about, sin just means missing the mark. Doing things and saying things that have me miss my, my goal, my aim of not ridding ourselves of just sin in our lives, but also burdens, things that keep us from being the man or woman that God's called us to be. And in doing that, we saw that last week, we said it was, we saw how it was helpful knowing that there's others that have gone before us. We used the example of St. Augustine who lived a long time ago, who said that he was, he was chained with lust from his youth. But we saw how Augustine became unchained, how he became free. And so that we could say, since he could do it, what's keeping me from doing it? And hopefully we left here last week all the more determined to, as we said, to throw the kitchen sink, to put in the work of ridding ourselves of the sins and burdens that cling to us, that keep us from running the race. And this week here, we have Paul, he tells us on, on what's needed for us to be successful in that. Out of six verses that we just heard, the one word came five times. Did you hear it? Discipline. Discipline. In verse 11, no discipline, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but rather painful. Later on, however, it produces the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who are trained by it. Discipline is training, or as, as the tradition calls it more, self-mastery. It's, it's doing things that I don't want to do or not doing things that I first want to do. And so therefore it's, it's, it involves this momentary pain, this momentary discomfort for a later payoff. That later payoff as Paul's using that analogy as an athlete is this freedom to run more free. And as we looked at an example a month ago of somebody who wants to play the piano, you don't just sit down and play the piano. You've got to discipline yourselves under the rules of piano playing so as to be free to play the piano. Is it not, is it not, the, case, is it not the case that usually the best of the best, no matter what pursuit in life it is, Usually the best of the best are the ones who are most disciplined. That's why Paul's using here the analogy of a runner running the race. Tom Brady, NFL quarterback, he was on being interviewed by Good Morning America one time after, I think it was his, you know, after one of his 30th Super Bowls that he played in. He was being interviewed and one of the hosts on Good Morning America just asked him that, uh, uh, he said, What's, what's the secret to your long-term success in the NFL? And Tom Brady turned and looked and simply just said, discipline. It's required a lot of discipline. And I think we get that, like in terms of sports and other things like that makes sense to us, even in the midst of a culture that just promotes instant gratification, we understand and it just makes sense. Okay, Tom Brady there with like football and other things, it makes sense to us. To, to undergo the current pain and discomfort to bring about a greater desired goal. But the ultimate gift of discipline, 
The ultimate gift of discipline is that it brings us closer to God. Again, verse 11, discipline produces the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who are trained by it. The, the fruit of righteousness, just think, think the indwelling of God in our soul, being in communion with the divine, becoming more one with him, which is the goal of our life. As we looked at a couple of weeks ago, St. Irenaeus, God became man so that we might become God. Do we see ourselves as being trained in righteousness? Like it happens, like the indwelling of God, like happens at baptism, which a few little ones after the mass here today is gonna, are going to be baptized. The indwelling of God's going to to happen, but it can be lost. Our human nature does not do well left on its own without training without discipline. Last week, we, we talked about the fact that because of our human nature, we will always struggle with the tendency to sin. And if that's not enough, you also have, you know, what, what the Lord, what, what God said to, to, to Cain right after the fall. Remember when Adam and Eve, right, the, the fall happened and then their two sons, Cain and Abel, right before Cain killed his brother, Abel, which sin usually leads just to more of a mess, to more of a sin, which is what we see in those first chapters. In chapter four, right before Cain killed his brother, God says to Cain, sin is crouching at your door, eager to control you. You must subdue it and be its master. Sin is described as an animal just crouching, waiting in a crouch position, eager to control. The idea is if you don't control it, it will control you. But we can subdue sin. We can be a master unto sin rather than having sin be a master to us. Paul elsewhere in one of his letters says, because we are in, because we have the, or, or live with grace in us, because the cross happened, we, we can now master over sin. Before that happened, before the cross happened, we don't have a shot to overcome and to be a master over sin. But Jesus' death on the cross conquered sin, conquered the power of sin. So as to us, allow us to be able to subdue it and to be a master over it. But it requires self-mastery. It requires discipline. We, it requires discipline and self-mastery for us to, over, to, to rid ourselves of every sin and burden that clings to us, that keeps us from running the race of being the man or woman that God's called us to be, in order for us to be stretched to become great, to be holy. So discipline, pain, it re requires much effort. As Thomas Aquinas once said, he says, avoiding, he says, avoiding sin, avoiding my tendency to sin, to choose to sin, he says, demands much labor. We sh the nitty gritty, right? Last week, we, I shared the story of, the, the, of, of a, young man who came to see me a number of years ago who was, who was, who was uh, uh, chained also like Augustine in lust, that he couldn't kick it. I asked him, what work are you putting in? He came back three months later, just said after three months that how he'd only slipped up one time and he proceeded to show me all the work that he had put in with the books that he'd read, the podcast that he subscribed to, the accountability partners that he, that he has. Combining the power of the grace of the sacraments with discipline, there are no limits. Like that, that's a pop, that's the, there are no limits of the greatness of which we can come, the holiness that we can reach combining the grace of the sacraments and discipline. Sins that we once struggled with, that once were masters over us, 
we become a master over them. And then we start building momentum. Doing the good becomes easier. Because just like it's hard to break a bad habit, and bad habits leads to us just missing the mark, it's also hard to break good habits. And good habits lead to freedom, which is the power of discipline and self-mastery. So question, question do, do, for us, do we see discipline that way? Like do, we, do we apply the same amount of discipline in our lives that we do for exercise and have a routine for exercise? Do we apply the same amount of discipline that we apply to, to, to work or to being a student? Or do I apply the same amount of discipline I apply to my golf game that I do to my walk in the Christian life? To keep us on the goal, to keep us stretched, growing in holiness. I just wanna end here with Paul's, Paul's writing this letter to the Hebrews to a community who's struggling. They've grown weak, beginning to kind of quiver in their faith a little bit. And those last two verses that we heard today, verse 12 and 13, Paul says this to this community. He says, so strengthen your drooping hands and your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet that what is lame may not be disjointed, but healed. So many of us, and it's so easy for us to be crushed by the weight of our sin, the guilt of our sin. But Jesus came to take away the guilt of sin. So, so go to confession, be freed from the guilt of sin. Be freed from the punishment of sin. That's what, his, that's what the death, his death on the cross accomplished, to free us from the guilt of sin, to free us from the punishment of sin. So go to confession and then get disciplined, get trained, grow in self-mastery. And whatever, and whatever it is that's weighing us down, that's clinging to us, that just is like, I need to get rid of this because it's keeping me from running the race. That stretch, that stretch for greatness will require much effort, much labor, but effort and labor that's only possible with him who died for our sins, who already knows our weaknesses, who sympathizes with weaknesses. As Paul says earlier in their letter, we do not have a high priest that is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who took on flesh, who took on sin, who knew no sin. He's gentle, he's kind, he's patient, he's merciful with you and me. So maybe when we come up and receive the Eucharist today, we receive that grace, or in the moments of silence that we have in this liturgy, let us rededicate ourselves to that power combination the power combination of the one, of his outstretched arm and the grace that comes from that, from the cross. And secondly, to rededicating ourselves to the good old fashioned discipline.